How are you guys doing? The Metal Gear Solid 3 Delta Remake announced during the Sony's 2023 PlayStation Showcase is one of the most anticipated up and coming games. It's a faithful remake of Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater and although the core story and characters remain unchanged, there are some significant upgrades and expectations regarding gameplay, voice acting and technology. But today I want to talk about is if some of the exploits and speedrun hacks from the original game potentially be in the remake. Under my skin, and I know exactly how this is. So as some of you guys already know, the game is being developed by Unreal Engine 5, which offers cutting-edge visuals from the trailers that we've already seen. Realistic lighting, enhanced character models, improved animations. The weather systems and environmental details like mud, water and foliage should also play a big role in the visual fidelity, immersing players in the dense jungle environments. Good, we've got high visibility. The survival systems have improved vastly in the game where injuries do stay a long time with the player as well as being able to use interface systems that can quickly change camo including improved codec features where players can make calls in game aside from important ones as well as calling in healing radio songs, cancelling alert statuses and calling for airstrikes. All of this whilst being on the move. We have legacy mode that allows us to use the old controls from the original and modernised controls that reflects advancements in third person action games. Since the original release, movements will feel smoother, aiming more precise and CQC more intuitive. This is MGS3. The fixed camera angles we remember from the original MGS3 on PS2 have been reworked to offer a more dynamic player control camera like Metal Gear Solid 5. If we remember the 3DS and the subsistence version gave us that ability to be able to move the camera but this appears to be a little bit more behind the shoulder similar to the likes of Resident Evil 4 that has mastered the third person approach in this camera style. This gives more players freedom to assess the environment and plan their approach in a more modernised style. It's worth pointing out that whilst the AI structures of the soldiers may be improved on, the behaviours of the soldiers and bosses in Metal Gear Solid 3 Delta Snake Eater will closely mirror the original game from 2004. The soldier patrols, reactions to noise and alert patterns remain largely the same depending on what difficulty we play on the game, maintaining that classic feel. Bosses too are expected to follow the same AI patterns as before keeping their original attack sequences intact. Which is the reason for this video, to showcase some of the exploits and speedrun hacks that several people have used that, for my opinion, make the game too easy to play and to get through, even on extreme mode. A part of me is hoping that they would change the AI structure because I want to play something that is challenging, but if they don't, I'm happy either way to experience it with what we've get. Some of you may already be aware of these exploits I'm talking about, but if not, buckle up because you're going to be interested to find out what they are. And to be fair, they can be very OP. Start of Metal Gear Solid 3, our first encounter with a KGB happens here. There's a technique known as Trank and Roll, which is most effective when the sentry isn't facing you. This move involves precise timing, relying on third person shooting to tranquilize the enemy, followed by rolling into them. It quickly incapacitates the guard, allowing you to stay on the move. Trunk and roll technique works incredibly well because the timing has to be perfect. Just as you shoot the enemy when he starts to turn around, rolling into him knocks him out instantly. CQC is still fun and effective, but when you know tricks like this, it almost takes away the incentive to use it. I mean, sure, guards can give you codec numbers and interesting bits of information, but I get why some people feel frustrated with the AI if the remake is a complete one-to-one -one copy without at least some sort of reworking or rebuilding and onto the AI. Some suggest that it should have been rebuilt entirely, the remake, whilst keeping the story and other essential things intact. Pressure sensitive buttons on the original PS2 version of Metal Gear Solid 3 added a nuanced layer to the gameplay. They allowed for you to perform different actions like holding or choking an enemy, 
based on how hard you press the action button. This feature was well suited for the PS2 controller, but became more challenging to replicate on other systems and consoles that didn't include pressure sensitive buttons. In the HD collection for the PS3, the pressure sensitive functionality was preserved, allowing similar gameplay mechanics. However, on the Xbox 360 version was lacking pressure sensitivity, and it had a different control scheme to accommodate this. Emulating the HD collection on the PC with a PS4 controller can be tricky, as I've experienced. And since I had a tough time sourcing an official PS3 pad, I bought a PS2 pad that apparently you can use on the RPCS3 emulator, but after messing around with drivers and software, I couldn't get these features to work on the pressure sensitive buttons. It's a common problem for those who play on emulator. The RPCS3 emulator and similar setups often struggle with replicating pressure sensitive features. Whilst you can change around the settings to actually make this function work, it's a nightmare to try and set it up for later controllers rather than using a PS3 controller. Without proper pressure Pressure sensitivity actions like interrogating, choking or slitting an enemy's throat can become simplified or malfunction. For instance, as you've noticed, using the circle button might immediately slit the enemy's throat instead of offering a range of actions based on the pressure sensitive buttons, such as interrogation or even moving the enemy. The PS2's pressure sensitive buttons allowed for aiming and holding up enemies without firing. For example, if you hold the square button, you could actually run around with your gun without shooting, and if you applied more pressure on the square button, it would fire off the gun. And if you let go gently, the gun would resume in its normal position. And that's the problem, because you couldn't interrogate enemies being stood up with the gun. If they're on the floor, however, I guess you can use it because you can just like shoot the ground and they still drop lootable items. But it just won't work when you're trying to hold up an enemy because it'll instantly fire off around and if you haven't got a suppressor, the entire, well, KGB unit and whatever soldiers are going to hear you coming. Come in, you can work around these issues if you're quick with the controls, by using the interrogation feature and then quickly throwing the enemy on the ground, or tapping the circle button to choke them out, so you can avoid trying to slip their throats. You can manage some of these actions, however, keeping the enemy in a hold and moving them isn't possible with the current setup on the emulator without the right controller. With the arrival of the Master Collection, these issues have been addressed. For example, on the Xbox Series X, you hold down the B button to get the enemy into a hold. Then you use the left trigger to interrogate them and press Y to slit the enemy's throat, which is a separate function rather than being the same button. This adaptation works well with today's hardware, but in my opinion, it highlights a larger issue. Why don't consoles retain the features that made them great and just evolve them? While pressure sensitive buttons may not be necessary anymore, it just feels like consoles have been moving away from what made them special. For instance, Sony's loss of backwards compatibility and charges for online gaming contribute to this perception. After the PS4, I transitioned to PC gaming. And I'm not hating on current console users, I'm an ex-console gamer myself and I'm just reflecting on how things have changed and I don't think they've changed for the better. Anyway, same goes for the gun, as you hold down the shoot button and don't let go of the button to shoot, you can hold up the enemy and press the L3 button, the stick, to cancel the aiming that the gun that you use which allows you to not pop a round off since there's no pressure sensitivity now. And given on the fact that MGS3 Remake will be on the Xbox and PS5, neither of them will have these sensitive buttons, which will most likely be relying on the Master Collection's new control schemes of what we know to be as the Legacy Control Scheme. It's evident that Metal Gear Solid 3 Remake has revamped the CQC mechanics, particularly with the takedowns, which is great since it's an improvement over the simple ground slams and repetitive animations from the original. Upon closer inspection, it seems the remake has taken inspiration from MGS5 CQC, at least with the takedowns. However, it's not clear from the trailers if these moves will knock the enemies out instantly, like they do in MGS5. Personally, I found that aspect of MGS5 disappointing, it felt robotic, because every soldier's pain tolerance would realistically vary, and it wouldn't just instantly knock them out after each move. In MGS3, most CQC moves wouldn't knock enemies out cold, except for the main slam which felt more realistic. But MGS5 CQC system did get a lot right, especially with its controls and fluidity. It was easy to grab an enemy, move them around, and keep them subdued without knocking them out, unlike in MGS3. MGS5 also improved on the MGS4 crosshair system. It wasn't as clunky, and it moved a lot smoother. Another excellent feature was the ability to disarm enemies and use their weapons, and counter knife attacks and implement a variety of martial art moves and punches. MGS5 retained some of the greatest features from MGS3, like interrogations, but improved the layout and mechanics. 
You could still choke out enemies, but with a better animation, or slip their throats, although MGS3 arguably presented that particular move way better. From what I've seen of the MGS3 remake, it looks like it's combining the best elements from both 3 and 5, giving players more options for handling situations and far more animations. What I love about MGS3 is that everything is procure on site, meaning you gather ammo and supplies from the enemies as you go. This added a survival aspect that MGS3 absolutely honed, unlike MGS5 where you had to really manage your own base and most of your ammo was scattered around enemy outposts or you would call in for a supply drop. But I guess each different feature was actually unique to really how the game presented itself and the particular kind of missions that we was on. One thing that would be great if the MGS3 remake incorporated was MGS5's counter system, because sometimes enemies get brazen and charge you if you've got an enemy in a holdup or you are relatively close. According to sources, Konami have tweaked the enemy AI systems to behave a little bit more intelligently, which will be interesting to see how they respond in battle situations. I've noticed when I was fighting the Ocelot unit, they would take cover behind trees and hide, and that was even back then on PS2. The AI was really good, so there's no doubt that Konami will have tweaked it at least a slight bit to make it more applicable by today's standards for remakes. The MGS3 remake, while receiving mostly positive reviews, does have some noticeable issues, especially regarding movement. Many players, including myself, find the movement too clunky, slow, and sort of floaty. It doesn't feel like Snake is running or moving fluidly, which could potentially disrupt the overall balance of the game. Some suggest this was done intentionally to make navigation more challenging, slowing the pace of the game to stretch its length, especially since there's no new jungle areas or expanded environments that seem to be included. However, it's clear that this is an issue. In the original version, the movement felt streamlined and just right, but the remake appears to have lost some of that fluidity. Keep in mind that that was showcased in Production Hotline 2 and the Legacy series with David Hayter, including the first in-engine look all of which was likely played on the modern control scheme rather than the legacy controls, which are said to retain the original mechanics from the PS2. This was even slightly showcased in the legacy video with David Hater, where the animations were still in development and hopefully still are. The movement's an issue, it's definitely noticeable, and I hope they address it before the release. It's better to delay the game and fix these problems than release it in a broken state. Metal Gear Solid 5 undeniably set a high bar for control mechanics, with seamless transitions between movement styles, from light pushes on the stick for stealth walking to full-on sprints, and fluid crouching and prone mechanics. The controls were intuitive and responsive. It gave players a sense of total control over Snake's actions, which many will hope will carry over into the MGS3 remake. What I'm really hoping for is that the movement gets improved by release and I would love to see a sprint function tied to the stamina gauge. Imagine this, sprinting could drain your stamina, giving players more reason to hunt for food. The higher your stamina, the more damage you could deal with CQC, and your movement speed would be affected too. This would really add another layer to the survival aspect, especially since in the original, low stamina only affected your aim. Expanding on that by adding effects to health and a susceptibility to injuries could really enhance the realism including the idea of Snake being tired and needing to take a moment to rest until he's eaten something. Plus, since the game is set in a jungle, it would be really cool if they threw more environmental dangers at us, like snakes just lunging from hidden grass. That would force the player to engage with the survival menu more and make the stamina and health gauges feel more meaningful. I think this could actually really help the pacing of the game, aside from making it more clunkier and slower from what we've seen from the controls, which some have argued, as I've said, is there on purpose to slow the pacing of the game because the game's not exactly massive like MGS5 in terms of its environment. So by doing that, it engages players to interact with the environment more around them in different areas. Although I do have to admit, a sprint function could definitely mess with the game's balance. But everything else seems like it would be a great fit to actually expand the game further and make it feel more like a survival game. After all, MGS3 is a survival stealth action game, and building on those mechanics could really take the remake to another level. And yes, to state the obvious to some commenters, no, I'm not a dev, and yes, I'm aware it's a one-to-one -one ratio remake. The trunk and roll exploit might still be a viable strategy in the MGS3 remake, particularly if the legacy mode closely mirrors the original mechanics. 
If Konami keeps the mechanics largely unchanged in the legacy mode, as they've indicated, it's likely that the techniques like tranquilizing an enemy and rolling into them to knock them out could still work. From what's been shown of the modern controls, the roll function is still present, and this suggests that players still might be able to roll into enemies after tranking them. But the real question is whether or not the roll will still have the same impact, i.e. keeping the enemy down, since the original version used physics and AI that was quite specific. The remake may tweak those systems to make them more balanced. It'll be interesting to see how these classic exploits work with updated and AI physics. There's definitely a possibility that the remake addresses this tactic, but more until detailed gameplay is released or tested, we really don't know for sure. So this is a strategy and not an exploit, but rather a smart way to take down the ocelot unit without getting spotted, especially if you're aiming for a no alert record at the end of the game. The timing is absolutely essential for this approach, and as you can see I'm moving around in circles to distract the guards from coming into the room before I throw the stun grenade. Even as a split second delay could change the outcome. The ocelot unit sequence where they swarm the building is a key moment where this kind of precision comes into play. In legacy mode, everything should work just as it did in the original, so the timing will still be crucial. However, in the modern mode, it's still unclear if the duration of these encounters or the AI behavior has changed, which could affect how you approach a situation. Either way, this is one of the best methods to handle this section, though there are other ways to do this as well. If you want to see another approach, check out George's channel to see how he handles this part of the game. Personally, I cannot wait to see how this section plays out in the remake. It'll be interesting to compare the two. This next strategy can be definitely considered an exploit because it allows you to completely dominate Ocelot in a boss fight, often before he even has the chance to take cover behind the rocks. The key here is to first hit him with a trank shot, then immediately toss a stun grenade, and right as the stun grenade is about to go off, shoot him again with a trank. You have to repeat this pattern usually three times before you shoot the goat. The timing is crucial for this method, and it stops him from moving and keeps him in place. You can use this strategy on any difficulty, including extreme, though in extreme mode you'll need to land a headshot for it to be more effective, and you get less grenades. Personally, I've been playing on an older save in hard mode to save time, and as long as you have plenty of ammo and a few stun grenades, you'll be fine. After repeating this process about three times, you can shoot the goat in the corner to keep Ocelot in the center of the battlefield and land as many good shots as possible. This method is particularly effective because it keeps Ocelot on the defensive and never giving him the chance to reposition or counter. It's a smart way to get through the fight quickly, but it does require precision and solid timing to pull it off perfectly. But still, it's quite OP. Next up is the pain, and to deal with him you need to use lethal weapons to repeatedly shoot him to stop him from throwing his pheromone grenades, which summons hornets to attack you. Once you've interrupted him, you switch to the Mark 22 and focus on landing headshots. Timing is everything here, so snapping the gun on and off to reload quickly is essential as every millisecond counts in this fight. Eventually the pain will use his hornets as armor, and at this point you'll need to toss a grenade to destroy it. You don't even need to switch to first person, just throw it in third person mode and it usually lands accurately enough. This process is the same every time. Land your headshots, toss a grenade to break his armor, and repeat. If you're accurate and don't miss, the pain becomes one of the easiest bosses to defeat. The toughest part is maintaining precision throughout the fight. If you've defeated Ocelot non-lethally and unlocked the animal camo, that can make this fight even easier, as it reduces swaying and improves your accuracy, which is crucial for landing those headshots. And this next section really goes without saying, the croc cap helps you get through this river section so easy, avoiding the guys on the hovercrafts so they can't see you when you're swimming past. But this is a feature here that's in the game. You can shoot the end with the SVD, cancelling the fight later on entirely. Something that will no doubt that will be retained in the remake, as it is an essential part of the game.
And next is the cardboard box exploit that is a massive OP function in MGS3. In Granin's lab as you make your way to his office, the scientists usually see through your disguise. So equipping the cardboard box allows you to run past several of them without triggering an alert, like it usually would without the box. It's insanity, as the box almost acts like an invisibility cloak at times, as well as making your moves through the environment quicker in areas that have hills or slopes. Up next is the fear, and by far the easiest boss to beat in MGS3. With this particular exploit, one simply rolls under a trap, takes a fake death pill and waits for the fear to make his approach. And just as he turns his back, you take the revival pill and pop a stun grenade. Just as it's about to explode, you trigger the trap and the swing spike completely depletes the fear stamina gauge, allowing you to beat him within seconds. One of the battles I particularly enjoy is the showdown with the legendary sniper, The End. I prefer to fight him with honour, as taking him down earlier feels cheap and detracts from the epic experience of a fair 1v1 survival battle. Another unique feature of the game is that if the player doesn't play MGS3 for a while or changes the system's clock, The End will die of old age. Drop your weapon! One of the greatest elements about facing the end is the aspect of the tense battle, where you have to look out for the end's footprints and use the directional microphone to try locate him. This fight takes place in one of the biggest forest sections of the game, with various locations, making it arguably the best sniper battle in the MGS series. The eerie feeling that the end might have his sights on you, combined with the ominous wind and animals seemingly communicating with him, adds to that layer of tension, and it makes it for quite a fun challenge. Personally, I would love to see this battle made for a more challenging experience in the remake. Considering the area of Soko Veno Forest is so expansive and big, it just seems like such a waste not being able to utilise it properly and almost pointless why they even put it there. I get, yes, whilst you defeat the end earlier on, you do come across the Ocelot unit that is patrolling the entire area of the entire forest, and there is exactly 10 enemies that you need to take out in total. Some are perched up in different areas with snipers, and some are just patrolling different areas of the forest. So whilst, yes, it doesn't actually take away from the experience and actually not utilizing the area fully i just think that the boss battle with the end should just be far more challenging it's like one of the bosses who actually deserves it he's this old classic legendary sniper that's been through so many battles it just doesn't make sense being able to kill him off so easily i kind of feel like some of these exploits really take away from the experience and the actual lore behind the characters of the cobra unit it's unclear if some of these exploits like tranquilizing and rolling in the cardboard box or using grenades that can noise cancel in certain areas were intentional. Even with the boss battle with the fear can be broken just by using a trap and several other bosses in the game, allowing you to beat these bosses in seconds. It's worth noting though that killing the end earlier on or waiting for him to die of old age doesn't grant you his sniper rifle or camo, so there's definite downsides to skipping the fight. What's interesting in MGS3's remake trailer is that it showcases Snake in the so-called Veno Forest using the Moisant Nagan against the Ocelot unit. This hints at the possibility of a new Game Plus feature where we might be able to use weapons collected from previous playthroughs. If true, that would add an exciting layer of replayability. Another one of these exploits whilst fighting the end is that he's usually perched up in the same location on the map, although it can differ on difficulties depending on the location, although the OP exploit still stands. For example, you can run behind the end with a grenade, cancelling your footsteps. Then you can hit him with the SIG spray and hold him up with the Mark 22, and then hit him with the spray again and throw a stun grenade at his body, locking him into this animation where he can't move whilst then hitting him with the spray once the grenade goes off, it's usually a pattern that works three to four times before he tries to run off, but by then you can anticipate where he's going to run to and hit him with the SIG spray again and hit him with a few punches, beating yet another boss in seconds like it's nothing. <laughs> Up next, we're fighting the Fury, and by far he has the most unpredictable AI, and the chances of using the exploit on him can be very slim. He's either landing to the left or the right, or side of the map, or directly in front of you, 
which usually cancels the exploit entirely. If he lands on one of the sides, you can trap him in the same location by snapping your sniper and Mark 22 on and off, depending on what you use. Sometimes he will try to go into the jetpack animation, giving you time to let off more rounds on him, although sometimes he's known to fly straight off. I appreciate how the Fury's AI is more advanced than the others, as you can't just usually mega dump him like the others, but sometimes you can trap him, and when he uses his flamethrower, you can hide in your box, move out of the way quickly and move back, hitting him with rounds, stopping him from using his jetpack, and if you use the sniper, it does double the damage, although it does require a little bit more skill to master. I love the quirkiness of MGS and of course the iconic cardboard box, but this particular exploit takes away from the realism and especially for a remake. After defeating the Fury and arriving at Groznygrad for the first time, the initial section isn't too remarkable. However, as you make your way towards the facility, you can use the box exploit again, and if you walk directly to a specific spot and time a headshot perfectly before the guard moves out of sight, it distracts another soldier allowing you to slip by completely unnoticed in the box, as if you're invisible. While the box is a part of what makes Metal Gear so unique, I feel like these kinds of exploits, though fun, take away from the overall immersion and realism, particularly in the remake where realism might be a bigger focus. It would be nice to see these moments tweaked to make the stealth gameplay more grounded, but without losing the quirky charm that defines MGS, but without making it too OP. First, let's take a look at your body, shall we? And who could forget the notorious torture sequence with Volgin where Snake is subjected to lethal attacks? There's that little trick of holding down the equip button throughout the entire session, which allows us to keep the life gauge completely full. I don't think this is an exploit, but rather an intended secret feature of the game. Whenever or not this will carry over into the remake remains to be seen, but it's definitely one of those moments that adds to the depth of the original experience. If they do keep it in the remake, I wonder if they'll add a modern twist to the mechanic, or leave it as it is for the fans who remember it. Lastly, when we return to Groznygrad, we can actually pull off another wild cardboard box exploit. You equip the box to distract one guard, then tranquilize the soldier behind him, which ends up distracting yet another guard. It's crazy because you can literally stay invisible in the cardboard box whilst the guards are completely unaware. I've had people in the comments sections accuse me of using cheats or mods, but I swear it's not. You can try it for yourself on extreme mode. I'm not sure how it affects the AI, but it definitely messes with their coding and vision, almost cancelling out any alert. It's just like the box just glitches the system, letting you breeze past for some of the hardest sections in the game without even breaking a sweat. It's fair to say that these exploits really do change the pace of the game, especially in terms of a challenge. Don't get me wrong, it's great fun and fantastic for speedrunners, but it feels outdated to me. I totally get why some players want a fresh experiencing without compromising the core story or structure. After all, Delta means change or difference without altering the foundation. As much as I think Konami is great, they're definitely not Kojima, who wasn't afraid to take risks and defy expectations. Konami has faced a lot of pressure from fans, and while the game will likely be great upon release, we can't expect anything groundbreaking. It's shaping up to be almost a carbon copy of the original, aside from some of the control updates and a few mechanical tweaks, animations, and of course, enhanced graphics. Personally, I'd like to think they've taken these exploits into account and removed them to make the game more challenging, giving us a truly new experience. After all, it is a remake, and some things should change. But with all that being said, the MGS3 remake still doesn't have a release date, so we'll just have to wait and see. Keep your eyes open on the Tokyo Game Show 2024 coming up on the September the 26th to the 29th. Konami will be hosting another Production Hotline free livestream where we will get a better look of what to expect. It's bound to be an exciting show and Silent Hill 2 is likely to be brought up as well. And, not to mention, Hideo Kojima himself will also appear on the 29th to talk about Death Stranding 2. So with that all being said, hit the subscribe button, then turn the notifications on for more Metal Gear Solid content, and hit that like button if you've enjoyed this. If there's anything I've missed out or anything you'd like to add, I'd love to hear your great thoughts in the comment sections down below. I'm The Voice Box, and until we meet again.